All right, let's get underway. Open your Bibles to the first letter of John. We're right near the end, so you can just turn right to the to the back. You will find uh, Revelation, and just before that, Jude, and just before that, Third John, Second John, First John. We're at First John chapter two. Our scholar we're using for these three short little letters, Dr. Clifton Black. He taught at Perkins School of Theology, Southern Methodist University, Dallas, and then was offered a prestigious chair in New Testament studies at Princeton and moved there. He believes that the author of these three letters is one and the same. One person he believes wrote all three. He believes the one who wrote these three letters was not the one who wrote the gospel and not the one who wrote the revelation, but that all of them have in common the Johannine community. And again, Johann is simply the German word for John. And since so much great biblical scholarship has come out of Germany, this name stuck in academic circles. So instead of calling it the community of John, it's called Johannine community. But it means that once the early disciples dispersed from the city of Jerusalem, uh, a community grew up around John, brother of James, son of Zebedee, and that community produced a gospel in time, three letters, and the revelation. But probably not the same person, and certainly none of the authors, John himself. Okay? All right, I think that's all we need to know about that right off. Let's pray before we start. God, we turn our attention to this all-important book of yours. We believe you found real people through whom you could work to get this important book put together. From what we know about the book, we know you did not tell them everything in every area of knowledge that every writer was limited by his own time and place, but that what you were concerned about was theology, that is, our knowledge about you, how you wanted to reveal yourself to us, how we could better understand what you were doing in your world, how we can respond to what you're doing and be a part of what you're doing. We pray today that as we turn to this letter written so many years ago that persons like Dr. Clifton Black can help us understand what we need to know and that you will also be here guiding and directing the works of our hearts and minds together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. If you're new with us, let me say we're so glad you've come. We are moving very quickly now to the end of this all-important book. As I mentioned, we have this longer first letter and then two very brief ones, second and third John. And then we have Jude, which is a tiny little book. And then we move into Revelation, 22 chapters. If you're also worshiping with us, you know that I'm doing six sermons out of the book of Revelation. But you will see, of course, that I'm just having to jump from place to place to deal with the six passages that our scholars believe are the most important ones. And we're not getting to a lot of the other details that you and I will get to in our Sunday school class. In the Sunday school class, we will go through every one of the 404 verses. 404 verses in 22 chapters, we'll deal with every one of them. And we'll be there soon. We will be there soon. I think uh, probably within about six weeks. So probably about the first Sunday in August. Just a guess right now, because I'm not going to rush us past the other material. Now, we're going to deal with all of it as we go, but it looks like around the first of August we'll be into the book of Revelation. And if it takes us three or four months, we'll spend three or four months. Whatever it takes to try to help you understand what you want to know and need to know about this work uh, called Revelation. Okay. So if you're new with us, let me tell you what I, I do. I go and try to find the very best scholar that I can who's written within the last 10 years, which was the last time we went through this material. So I'm looking for something new that I had not read before. I'm looking, of course, for mainline Christian scholarship. And I mean by that those of us who have built the great seminaries of the world and whose seminaries meet all the academic criteria to be fully accredited. That is not true of all seminaries in this country, of course. We have 13 that belong to the United Methodist Church in this country. 
but we accredit a number of others who have great libraries, professors with PhDs from other accredited colleges and universities and so on. We do have a university senate, it's called. We Methodists have a university senate. We elect members of that uh, university senate in every fourth year when we have general conference. They are nominated. Uh, we have biographical material about every person who's nominated, a, a photograph and biograph material. And then after much prayer and thought and several days that you can look through all those materials, then we vote. We elect people who will visit colleges, universities, seminaries, and, and decide which should be accredited and which should not. So I'm, I'm reading only those that I think really do practice great scholarship. But within that community... We've been finding Episcopalians and Presbyterians and Lutherans, a Quaker that we dealt with recently, um, Methodist, of course. Uh, we're disciples. We're, we're looking Roman Catholic. I don't want to leave any of these out that, that, that are, are graduates and now professors in these great institutions of ours. And so we've had some of all of those as we've gone through the whole Bible together. This one now teaching at a Presbyterian seminary, Pre, uh, Princeton in New Jersey. All right, let's begin with verse 18 of chapter 2. Children, it is the last hour. Now, this is all, this is pretty much true, I think, of everybody in the New Testament, all the writers, they believed the time was really near an end. They believed it was. Um, everything they knew caused them to believe so, and the fact that they now believed God's fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures, Jesus, the long awaited Messiah had come, then what was the purpose in going on and on? The end must be very near. And when we get to Revelation, I'll try to make that point with you again, because I believe it's true. Everything John wrote about was something going on in his own time. He was not even envisioning a 21st century this person wasn't capable of envisioning a 21st century. He was writing about the year 95 or 96, that first century of this new common era. Okay. Uh, so these authors coming out of the community of John uh, all had a similar belief. The end is near. Children, it's the last hour. As you have heard that Antichrist and anti, as you know, is in, a, in a Greek context, means just simply opposition to or the opposite from so anything that opposes christ would be an antichrist so now many antichrists have come from this we know that it's the last hour they went out from us but they did not belong to us for if they had belonged to us they would have remained with us but by going out they made it plain that none of them belongs to us but you've been anointed by the holy one and all of you have knowledge I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? That's what it would be in Hebrew. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Everyone who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. I write these words to you concerning those who would deceive you. As for you, the anointing that you've received from him abides in you. And so you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, abide in him. And if you want to hear more Similar uh, to that, turn to the gospel, according to St. John, chapter 15, and you will hear um, almost verbatim some of those same thoughts. This is material from the same community. <clears throat> and now, little children, abide in him so that when he is revealed, that means the coming again, the perusia, we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look here and see how Dr. Black can help us. And again, what I do is go through and read for you and, uh, and try to, to highlight sentences that I think are most important, but we cannot spend all of our time on all the many arguments these scholars present. Okay, perhaps no segment of First John is more troubled than the passage we've just read. 
This pericope, okay, here again, if you're new with us, this word appears often in good biblical work. The scholars who deal with the Bible love this word, pericope. And I've told you that it's really not a, a, a difficult word, but I didn't know it before I went to seminary. The first part, peri, has to do with around. And we use it in the word perimeter, okay, the distance around something. How many meters around? Okay, so it has to do with around, and cope has to do with cutting. So the word is really simple. It's a cut around. Uh, some passage that you can cut around and lift out and deal with without distorting it in any way. You can deal with that, that portion. And so this is such a portion here. This pericope we've just read bespeaks a Christian community undergoing deep disturbance. <clears throat> the elders' children, he calls them, have heard of Antichrist's coming, which suggests that a counter-Christ or opposing Christ was some figure expected within the community addressed by this writing. It is remarkable to learn from the elder that Antichrist has come more than one, in fact. All of these images are associated with evil's last massive assault before God's final victory. Likewise, in 1 John, the coming of Antichrist confirms that the church is living in a final hour. Lying, attributed by the elder who wrote this uh, material to this Antichrist, recalls the fourth gospel, that is the gospel of John's characterization of the devil as a liar and the father of lies. You may recall that when uh, Dr. Brandon Scott gave our Barton Clinton Gordy series, uh, the very first presentation that morning, he, he, he decided to deal with uh, the temptations of Christ shortly after his baptism. And he told you then that the word that we translate devil literally means the liar, the liar. And that's what Dr. Black's picking up on here as well. OK, according to first John, exactly what does this opposing Christ do? Here, Antichrist coming is evidenced by only two things, he mentions, a secession of some Christians from the Johannine community and a denial of Jesus that entails a denial of God. A schism has occurred within the Johannine fellowship. Could some have denied that Jesus is the Messiah? And if the son is denied, so too is the father who sent him. The split now reveals those who have really belonged to the church from the beginning and exposes those who have not. And anointing from the Holy One, which may refer either to God or to Christ, has endowed all of the church with the capacity to discern what is true and what is not. So the elder who writes this material, and that's what he calls himself, remember the presbyter, elder urges his readers to do is persist that they may continue in the son and in the father and the root verb may know for abiding and persisting prominently refers in John's gospel to the mutual indwelling of God and Christ in the Christian believer. The outcome promised to us then is eternal life for the first time in the New Testament. A church has fallen apart over a matter of critical importance. We've read in Paul's letter to the Corinthians that that church was always on the brink of falling apart. Well, here is one that's really in trouble. At the time of this letter's composition, that wound of a congregation tearing itself apart was fresh, gaping and raw, Dr. Black says. The wall of the whale, sorry, the whale of betrayal in First John is very likely proportionate to just how much the elder and the secessionist once shared. Had they not been so close, he could have regarded their departure with some indifference. In First John, the passage we've just read, the elder's primary point is that if we get Jesus wrong, then we shall surely misconstrue the God who sent him. And if our understanding of God is corrupted, then the way we live will inevitably be deformed. So the old saying, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere, is an idea far more naive and dangerous than any that the elder puts forward. Anointing refers here either to baptism or to the community's tradition affirmed at baptism. 
A third possibility is grounded less securely in 1 John than it is in the Gospel of John, and that is the anointing to which the elder refers is the coming of the Holy Spirit. I will go to my father, you remember it says in John, I will pray to him and he will send you the paraclete. This comforter, the King James translated it, counselor, advocate, other translations uh, translate the word. So the spirit sent by God in Jesus name will teach the disciples all things, reminding them of all that Jesus said to them. That's in Gospel of John, chapter 14. And like the fourth gospel, the first epistle here assumes the closest possible relationship among the father, the son and the spirit that is sent by father and son to dwell among those who believe in Jesus. Okay, let's hold there just a second. Let me remind you that by the 90s of that first century, we're already more than 60 years, almost 70 from the death and resurrection of Jesus, Jews were no longer in the Christian church. John, of course, was a Jew, as was his brother James, Andrew, Peter, all of them Jews. And some of the very first followers of Jesus were Jews. But Paul and others who followed him went strongly into the Gentile community and began to teach them and preach to them that there's only one God. That was the first big hurdle because these Gentile communities were polytheistic, multiple gods. Uh, they had the old gods and goddesses of fertility. They called them by different names in Greece or Rome, uh, uh, ancient Babylon, but they all had them. Uh, gods and goddesses of fertility. And so Paul first had a big job, any who went into the Gentile community, trying to convince them there's only one God. And second, trying to convince them that the one God had revealed himself most clearly in Mary's child, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, the Gentiles could buy into that in some ways more easily because they didn't know the Hebrew scriptures. They didn't know that the Hebrew scriptures really spoke of a Messiah who would come and rout the enemies of Israel. And I pointed out in the sermon last Sunday, if you were here, that so many of the people, Christians in our country who want to talk about Revelation more than any other book in the Bible, believe that God sent the lamb the first time, but by golly, he'll get it right and send the lion the second time. And our scholars say they're wrong. We got a lamb the first time and we'll get a lamb the second time. That God chose to reveal himself in the Passover lamb that was murdered, slaughtered uh, by our sin and those of our mothers and fathers before us. Uh, the abuses of the power entrusted to us, and the mistreating of each other and so on. Okay. So what's happened by the mid 90s is that the next generation of Jews are back in the synagogue and Christianity has become a Gentile movement. It's a Gentile movement. So he could be referring to the next generation of Jews who've gone back to the synagogue saying he's not the Messiah, Jesus. He's not. He looks nothing like the Messiah that we were we were taught about in the Hebrew scriptures. Or he may be referring to some Gentiles who came into the faith, who believe for a time, OK, there's only one God. This God revealed himself in Jesus of Nazareth, whom they never got to see. Remember. But as time went on. Those early Christians who had started talking about, but he'll be back soon. He'll be back soon. He'll be back soon. Hey, 70 years have passed. He's not back. So people were wandering off, if you would. They were wandering away. And that's what John's concerned about. And that's what he's trying to address here is the people who are wandering off. Let's begin chapter three. We have the little verse 29. If you're looking on with me, you'll see that 29 is, is hooked right on to the first verse of chapter 3. And the reason for that being that Dr. Metzger and others who translated this work for you and me believe that those who first divided it by chapter and verse didn't get it right. 
makes more sense for 29 to go with what follows than with what goes before. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who does right has been born of him. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. Not just when Jesus comes back. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Okay. Let's let Dr. Black help you here. Just a few sentences. The community of faith is encouraged to dwell for now in that domain that has been defined by Christ so that later when he is revealed at his regal coming, Perugia, the church may stand before him boldly confident. Now, Perugia is a Greek word that typically refers to the arrival of a potentate. The term was adopted by early Christians to depict Christ's second coming. What the church will be when he appears is not yet clear to this presbyter. John's gospel dwells on Jesus' oneness with God. So here we have two family traits of God's children. First, if you really are a child of God, then you will do righteousness. And remember, righteousness means right standing. So standing right with God by trusting that we do have the goodwill of God just because that's who God is, not who we are. God wants good to come to us because that's who God is. But if that be the case, then we're supposed to want good to come to each other. If I believe God loved me just as I am, then I'm supposed to at least start with others just where they are. And where I can make life better for them, richer, meaning, more meaningful for them, I'm supposed to do that. That's what agape is all about. So people who know themselves to be children of God are supposed to do righteousness, he says. And second is purity, uh, which may be understood in the sense of unimpeachable sincerity or moral uprightness. Yet this author is equally insistent that human acts of justice or purity are not the precondition for God's favor. That is, God has already given us his grace. Before we do anything good, he's already done something wonderful. Such conduct on our part is a response to what God has already done. It doesn't make God love us. It doesn't make God give us grace. That's already been given. It's how we're responding to it. So the child of God is a responsible agent and is responsible and able to respond by the endowment of God's love. OK, let me show you. He uses two different words here that I can't I can't pronounce that that differently. OK. Dr. Black is using these two words. Okay. Um, By saying we are responsible, he means, if you've experienced the grace of God, you believe he's extended his grace to you and you've received that gift, then you are responsible for treating others the way God wants them to be treated. If you believe he loved you just as you are, because that's who God is, then you've got to believe he loved the one on either side of you, back of you, in front of you, just because that's who God is for that person also. And it makes you responsible for treating them the same. Now, again, it really helped me when a professor said one time, you don't have to like everybody because there are a lot of unlikable people. A lot of unlikable people. The story the Dalai Lama loves to tell, and if you've ever seen him interviewed, uh, I've heard him tell this more than once. 
that those who are keenly attuned to the teachings understand that they are loved and therefore must be loving. And he said he finally got to talk to one of his young monks who had been imprisoned by the Chinese for 23 years. Young when he went in, now a middle-aged man when he finally got out. And the Dalai Lama was asking him how had he fared through all those years. And he said, kind sir, I was most worried. Two afternoons, I almost failed to love the Chinese. In 23 years. Two afternoons, he had almost failed to love the Chinese. What we Christians are supposed to be is responsible, not irresponsible. But the second point Dr. Black is making is you are able to respond. You are able to respond because the Holy Spirit has been sent to help you. Remember, Luke uses the word dunamis. And in the verb form, it means to be able. In the noun form, it means to have power or to, it is about power. Power. You are able to respond because God has already loved you. Is that clear? OK, I think that's clear enough. All right. Let's go on a little farther. Verse four. OK, chapter three, verse four. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God. Nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. Okay. The problem suggested in this pericope is a profound confusion of sinful conduct with what it means to be righteous. The author of First John thinks it necessary to make assertions that seem self-evident to him. That is, everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, let me show you again what he's saying here. Um, all of a sudden, I can't know me. Okay. In Greek... The word nomos is translated for us as law. And there was a movement after Paul's teaching about grace to say, well, we are no longer under the Torah. So we can do whatever we like. I've got a sermon I haven't written yet, but I'm already anticipating it in the middle of July after the four, six Sundays on Revelation. Uh, the lectionary takes us right back to Paul's letter to the Galatians. And I've preached on this text before many years ago, but I haven't written the new sermon on this text where Paul is uh, writing to the church at Galatia who are debating now about whether these grown Turks have to be circumcised or not, whether they have to do Torah. And he is saying to them, if one is in Christ, then circumcision no longer matters. Religiously speaking, doesn't matter. Nor does uncircumcision. And this antinomianism is about 
uncircumcision. That is, when these grown men get this letter from Paul saying you don't have to let these people get at you with their sharp little knives, they're going to say, we, we don't have to. And that's the attitude of a lot of American Christians I know. We don't have to. And this author is saying, well, guess what? You do have to not be circumcised, but you have to do Torah because sin is antinomianism. I'm leaving out a letter there somewhere. No, me, me. It's I-A-N in it. That's where the letter goes. No, me in it. That's it. I left out an A. I knew it didn't look right. Antinomianism. Anyway, it's saying I don't have to do Torah anymore. Paul is saying you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to eat kosher. But what about those Ten Commandments? Hear, O Israel, the Eye, Asher Eye, is our Elohim. You must have no other Elohim but Him. You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not lie, you shall not covet, you shall not sleep with your neighbor's husband or wife, etc. Oh, he said, you didn't escape all of those. Not by any means. Sin is lawlessness. It's antinomianism, and that's not Christianity. Okay. Uh, all right, we dealt with that. Everyone who does what is right is righteous. All who do not do what is right are not of God. Exactly what the elder means by sin here is hard to say. In the Gospel of John, which produced the Gospel, that same faith community, we know it's fleshed out more. In the Gospel of John, sin is described as a fundamental, fatal opposition to God, revealed by the refusal to believe in God's Son, Jesus. So in 1 John, sin is generally identified as lawlessness associated with not doing what is right. Uh, if sin is considered no real problem, then there is no real need for a Christ who is competent to eradicate sin. In other words, this author believes sin is very serious. And if you haven't been to church yet this morning, I'm going to try to convince you at 11 o'clock that the one who wrote the Revelation believes sin is serious business. I'm going to talk about that white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the Pale gray, King James says, Dr. Metzger and those who translated for you say the pale green horse. Well, we'll look at those horses at 11 o'clock and how serious sin really is. Okay, if sin is considered no real problem, then there's no real need for Christ to be competent in eradicating sin. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin, this author says. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the liar, the devil. No one who abides in him, in Christ, sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Those who have been born of God do not sin. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Did any of you happen to see the uh, young woman from Liberia who was interviewed on OETA at, at 8 o'clock on Friday night? Did you see her? Last uh, year in Fort Worth when we had general conference, one of the persons who electrified that crowd, electrified that crowd, was the new woman president of Liberia. But she's in her 70s. She's been a Methodist Christian all her life. She was absolutely wonderful. They finally got rid of Charles Taylor, who had thrown their country into anarchy for more than a decade. But they had the young woman on Friday night on OETA who had begun the movement, a woman's movement, against all these marauding, plundering, raping, murdering men. And two American women went to Liberia to film what was going on there as these women began to meet. First, just praying together. And after 50 women, there was 100. And after 100, there were 200. And after 200, there were 400, 800, 1,000. It became 25,000, 50,000 women who were praying. And the name of the documentary is called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. I thought that was great. 
pray the devil back to hell. One of the things, you know how they got the men under control? No sex if they kept on all this warring and fighting. No more sex. By golly, not till this war stopped. The men got more serious about it after that. These women prayed the devil back to hell. It was amazing uh, what happened there and how Liberia began to change. And when the women got the right to vote again, they elected a woman, uh, a Harvard University graduate who grew up in Methodist schools and then came to this country, got a splendid education, has worked for some of the largest banks in the world, and now she's running that country. I told you when she was she told us that when she first was elected and her entourage would start through the, through the city, uh, <clears throat> that little children would run in fear. They, they recognized this official car. But she said after a year, the little children run to us so that our car can hardly move through them. They want to just touch me, just touch me for me to touch them. These are my grandchildren, she said, my grandchildren. Well, it was it was a, a wonderful thing. Um, this liar, this liar that causes people to do the horrible things they do to each other. Uh, Christ has made it possible for us to rid our lives and our communities and our societies of him. Let me remind you that this author is much closer to Judaism here in some ways. And I want you to understand the difference. When Jesus was preaching, uh, and we believe a number of his preachings, teachings were gathered by Matthew in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, and that Luke uh, had a similar gathering of material that's called the Sermon on the Plain. Um, they give different settings to when these words were spoken, but otherwise they're very similar. Matthew's version is longer than Luke's, but but they're very similar. And, and with uh, map colors, back when I was studying uh, the Gospels in Greek, uh, I had a Gospel parallel in Greek, and you could see entire sentences and verses where Matthew and Luke had a similar source. They didn't vary even one word. Remember, Luke was a Gentile. We're pretty sure about that. Luke was a Gentile, and the person who wrote Matthew was a Jew. And so in Matthew's gospel, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, you've heard it said by men of old, but I say to you. And he says he's not abolishing the law. He's fulfilling it, fulfilling it. Uh, you've heard it said you shall not murder. But I say to you, don't call your brother or sister Raka, uh, fool. Um, and the word means more than our F-O-O-L. It, it also means worthless worthless don't even call one of your brother's sister worthless he says uh, it will get you into serious trouble with god now he didn't mean that you start murdering and that's okay as long as you don't call anybody a fool of course he meant no do not murder but don't even call people worthless ugly fools and so on all right well as this long sermon as matthew records it for us plays itself out finally jesus says be perfect the way your father in heaven is perfect. Jews would say, OK. But Greeks would say, whoa, we can't do perfect. Socrates, Plato and Aristotle told us we couldn't do perfect. That perfect is in that level above us, not where we are. That where we are is imperfection. And I've gone through this with you before. Those of you who study classical philosophy will remember this. That they talked about on this plane, nothing that we have is perfect. And I used the chair because my professor did all those many years ago. A chair. A chair's legs are too long for some, too short for others. Too hard for some, too soft for others. Too wide for some, too narrow for others the back too far back for some too close up for others no perfect chair except up there and so here's luke going right along uh, people believe that they both had in front of them in their separate writings a quella a source we no longer have but the fact that they're they have whole verses where they don't vary even one word we think Yep, they're looking at the same source here as each writes. And a Jew's writing Matthew and almost for sure a Gentile's writing Luke. So Matthew says to a Jewish 
Christian audience, be perfect the way God is. Okay. And Luke comes to that word and says, be ye merciful as your God is merciful. Luke is saying these Gentiles aren't going to get that. These Gentiles have been steeped in Greek philosophy now for more than 300 years that tells them nothing in this life is perfect. Whereas Jews believe that God has enabled you to do what he asked you to do. If he told you to do it, you can do it. If he's asked you to be responsible, he has made you responsible. You can do it. So get on with it. And this author believes the same. If this is what God wants you to do, you can do it. And if you don't do it, you're still sinning. And if you're still sinning, you must not believe. That's the argument that he's following. Okay. Um, I think we've dealt with enough of that. Yep, I think enough of that. Let me try just a couple more sentences here. This author insists that sin be regarded with a seriousness that cannot come easily in a Western culture that's more comfortable in speaking of crimes and misdemeanors, inappropriate behavior and no fault in almost everything from divorce to driving a car. The fact that many in our world refuse to regard sin as sin not just inappropriate behavior, but as something that is offensive to Almighty God, demonstrates the devilishness of this world's affections, Dr. Black says. Okay, let's go on. Verse 11. For this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one, the liar, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word, or speech, but in truth and action. In other words, don't tell me you love, show me. Okay. Well, let's see what Dr. Black can help us with here. This segment, ah, I didn't use pericope this time. This segment's train of thought is hard to follow. This is partly due to the author's penchant for wide conceptual swings between deeds that are evil and those that are righteous, between brothers who are murderous and those who are loving, between death and life. The representative figure for this constellation of motifs, he said, is Cain, who killed his brother Abel, as we know. Cain was motivated by evil and his brother by righteousness. The story of Cain is appropriate to the Johannine church because it pictures a devastating rupture within a family between brothers. Cain's butchery was a derivative of the evil one. This elaborates the point made in chapter 3, verse 10. That is, by their conduct, children resemble their parents for good or for evil. The elder, the writer he means here, it's what he calls himself, the elder, redefines death, a biological state, as an existential condition. That is, we're in death now if we do not love. We're dead. We just don't know it yet. The implication is clear. By hating his brother, Cain spiritually predeceased Abel. Follow that? Cain was already dead when he killed his brother. 
And so do all others who hate their siblings. They died before the siblings. And the converse of this axiom also holds true. That is, eternal life is not just future survival beyond the grave, but an accomplished reality for those within the community whose love for one another demonstrates their crossover into life that is real and indestructible. If any doubt should linger about what such love looks like, it is erased by remembering Jesus. He's what love looked like. By this we have known love, the author says. He laid down his life for us. The elder offers a matter-of-fact example of what he has in mind, and that is practical attention to those who are lacking life's basic necessities paid by those with means of livelihood, which is translated riches for you and me. Such love is not a self-generated project or human attainment. It is merely God's love working through us. So the elder proves able to head in a different direction, anticipating the sad but sage appraisal of Walt Kelly's comic strip, Possum, and that was in Pogo. Remember all those years ago? When this possum announced one day, we have met the enemy and he is us. So first, John three, the verses we've just read, pushes us to take a hard look at the violence in our world and to look through that violence to its root. We don't have agape for each other. Hand hate a gun and someone gets murdered. As the elder could have predicted, most of the murderers are not strangers to their victims, but members of the same family or neighbors to each other. Husbands knife their wives, wives shoot their husbands, children and parents kill each other. The Cotton Patch translation of 1 John says, My little ones, let's not talk about love, not sing about love. Let's put love into action. And make it real. Okay. Let's go on. Verse 19. Everybody's happy. All right. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he's given us. Okay, Dr. Black, if one's conduct manifests truth which in First John is the integrity of word and deed, the authenticity of one's life is thereby known to others. The heart, and this is cardia, from which we get words like cardiologist and so on, the heart is used to refer to the seat of religious and moral conduct. Uh, when you go to uh, parts of biblical cities that were ruled over by the Roman Empire, you find that they call the main street the Cardia. Those who've been to Jerusalem will recall that as they've continued to dig down, you, you, you know that in truth, archaeologically speaking, old cities get covered over by new ones. Old buildings fall down from earthquakes or whatever, or they're destroyed, and new ones are built on top. So if they've kept digging down into Jerusalem, they found several different layers. And when they got down below the street level, a whole building full, they found these Roman columns, uh, marble columns, not native to Israel, but brought in by the Romans while they controlled the city and the old Roman Cardia. And some of you were with us when we ate at a restaurant there and you get to put on togas and laurel wreaths and, and they served you uh, what they believe Romans ate in the first century. Um, those of you who've been to 
uh, other ancient communities, Ephesus, and those of you who have seen the ruins of Ephesus, are taken down the Cardia, the main street of that ancient city. Uh, uh, so cardia is an important word uh, in Latin, and it's an important word in Greek as well. And cardia, in this case, is a Greek word, and it's used to refer to the seat of religious and moral conduct. So our hearts might condemn us without full account of the evidence. In that event, the verdict in our case is overruled by a higher court, God himself, who knows everything necessary to render valid judgment. Okay. Um, another simpler possibility is that our hearts do not condemn us so that we may stand with assurance before the judge. We are positioned to receive from God whatever we ask, provided that an important condition has already been met. That is, that we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. The church should not be surprised by the world's feeling about us Christians. The critical point underscored by this author is that the community's requests of God are not self-interested. While all things are possible for God, petitions to him are offered in the name of Jesus, the one who instructed his disciples to pray first that God's will might be done. So here we find first John's most explicit definition of God's commandment. First, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, how closely is that tied to the Gospel of John? Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was God. It was in the beginning with God, and nothing was made that was not made by the Logos. And the Logos was made flesh. He came unto his own, his own received him not, but to those who received him, who believed in his name. He gave the dunamis, the power to become children of God. Okay? So, this author, coming out of that Johannine community, says, Number one, believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And here the simplest meaning would be to accept and confess the basic Christian proclamation that God has so loved the world that he's given his son Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Without faith in Christ, we are not able to love one another properly, nor can we truly believe in the name of Jesus Christ without properly loving one another. Paul's insistence upon faith working through love. When we get back to Galatians, that's going to be one of the key portions. In Christ Jesus, circumcision no longer matters. Circumcision, uh, uncircumcision no longer matters. What does matter? A new creation. What does matter? Faith that works through love. Being of the truth and abiding in him are essentially synonymous for this author. Um, to abide in Jesus Christ is to do the truth. That is, that God was in Christ, and revealing love to us as it never had been before, and therefore we know what love looks like. Now we're supposed to act like love. So being of the truth or abiding in him is also interchangeable with abiding in the light. By what do we know that he abides in us? By the spirit that he's given us. And this spirit is continuing the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are, are we acting more and more like him or more and more like them? So we find in verse 24, another instrument by which the church may verify its abiding in God's life. And that is that we corroborate with the Holy Spirit, which is itself a gift of God. So our Supreme Court is not the human heart whose feelings can be fickle. Our court of final appeal is God. This elder's conviction that we receive from him, whatever we ask, is also complex, of course. The promise of answered prayer is balanced against another consideration. 
Our prayers are answered if we keep his commandments and do before him what is pleasing. So obedience is the environment from which our petitions flow. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. This is the gospel again that's reflected here in this letter. Then ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Okay, but our prayer, if we are doing the will of God, is that God's will be done and that God be pleased. If that's really your will, then ask for it and it'll happen. Okay, that God's will be done and that God be pleased. Okay, anybody have a question? Everybody happy? Okay, we're going to stop there. Um, the Penseras are on vacation. And so today we have uh, a guest who will be directing the choir. And you have a guest organist, Mike McCrary. Uh, Mike was organist for many years at university. United Methodist Church here, right across the street from the University of Tulsa campus, now virtually surrounded by the campus, uh, and has agreed uh, to, you know, Susan's invitation to come and play for us today. I didn't really know Mike personally, and you probably know that uh, on Sundays, Brenda Reed goes through all the registration forms uh, as fast as she can. And when we get home from lunch on Sunday, Brenda has sent to my house uh, by telephone or, or Internet all the first time visitors. And uh, the goal is that every Sunday before I go to go to bed, I do my best to talk to every one of them that very same day. So one of the names she sent me last week was Mike McCrary and his telephone number. And when I called Mike, he said, uh, I was there to sort of check out what Dr. Pensera does on Sunday mornings. He said she had sent me the bulletin and I knew in print, you know, what I was going to be expected to do. But I just wanted to experience it for myself. So I was worshiping with you to, to see exactly how Dr. Pensera does it before I get to do it next Sunday, which is today. So uh, you'll, you'll be blessed, I'm sure. Don't rush off if you haven't been to church yet.